Hello, homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip, and this is the Homebrewed Christianity Podcast. Oh, yeah, the place where we try to get you some ingredients so that you can brew your own faith, your own theology, and that kind of thing. We don't, we're not going to tell you what to, what to drink. We aren't even going to try to convince you that Miller Lite Christianity tastes good. You know what I'm saying? Try to, we want you to brew it yourself. Get all crafty and junk. And here, this week, um, I'm going to be talking with my friend, uh, ex-pastor on Twitter, Greg Horton, uh, former podcaster, hardcore blogger, and a wine reviewer, uh, and religion professor to under, in undergrad right there in Oklahoma. Um, Greg Horton is on the podcast, and um, we're going to have a blast. We're going to talk about the uh, 10 reasons or 10 things um, he, he kind of learned about being a minister. You don't know until you're a minister. And, um, and, and he's left the building. You know, he's no longer... A Christian, he's a skeptic, and uh, it's it's so it's kind of a look under the hood of what goes on in the ministerial life, and uh, it, it's a lot of fun. It's theological, and it's insightful, and it's heartfelt, and it was fun. And I think if you like it, we're gonna do another one on the uh, top ten things that uh, you you learn in your first religion class that your grandma didn't tell you, and then maybe like play it out like, oh, the skeptic sees it this way, trip is nerdy this way, and have fun and stuff. Anyway. Um, looking forward to that. Uh, coming up, uh, we got Homebrew Christianity live at Wild Goose in just a week on Thursday night. Uh, you should be there because it's going to be crazy. Uh, a little choose your own adventure theological storytelling. We got some serious games, a theological bingo with some giveaways, all kinds of excitement stuff. Wild Goose Festival in uh, North Carolina. And then we got a live Homebrew Christianity podcast September 3rd with uh, Reza Aslan, the guy who. Uh, wrote the book Zealot about Jesus, a Muslim scholar writing about Jesus. Yeah, you're only confused if you work for Fox News. You saw the video. Anyway, you can hop on homebrewchristianity.com, find out about the live events, get your tickets, come there, be there, um, and uh, find out. I think we're even going to be able to, uh, to to connect if you're not in Los Angeles so you could be able to join the live event live via the interwebs. Uh, also, coming up, we have uh, a couple high gravity. That would be... Um, like super awesome um, reading groups, learning groups online. We got two of them coming up in September. We have High Gravity Religion and Science with Philip Clayton. That's right. The man who edits Oxford's Religion Science Encyclopedia. The guy who wrote Religion and Science of Basics Guide. A homebrewed Christianity regular. Uh, my uh, graduate school advisor and friend, uh, co-author or, uh, with uh, Transforming Christian Theology, the man behind Theology After Google and Big Tent Christianity and all that kind of stuff, Philip Clayton. We're going to spend six weeks looking at religion and science, covering all kinds of topics. Um, and uh, we're going to start that in September. And th- the great thing about this class, Philip's going to drop a one-hour introduction to religion and science presentation at the beginning. And then we'll spend the next five weeks looking in-depth at each topic, the science, the data, different ways of looking at it and stuff and having fun nerding out. Um, And then you're going to actually get the PowerPoint presentation that he used at the beginning. All the notes have looked at it, and you'll be able to do a one-hour religion and science class and tailor it to fit in your own congregation, you know, your study group, friends, and such. Uh, So there you go. That's a double reason. Not only will you get to learn about religion and science, but then you'll, you'll have this presentation by master ready right there for you to, to rock it in your own flavor flave yeah and phil will be wearing a giant you know gangster rap clock on his chest or not i don't know can't confirm anyway then coming up after that uh peter rollins back doing high gravity um atheism for lent i'm not going to tell you when it is but it may or may not be during lent you'll guess anyway um you can also go over to mission solutions dot com solutions yeah yeah and uh, sign up for those classes. There will be links through on the blog. Um, you can also download the class we just finished, the high gravity class with me and Pete doing radical theology. You can read a little Heidegger, read a little Caputo, have yourself a little fun. You would get six 90 plus minute sessions talking about it. Anyway, thank you for listening to Homebrew Christianity. Um, go to the website, find links to all of Greg, our guest this week's stuff. Live tickets, classes, and things. And uh, remember to click your Amazon link on Homebrewed Christianity when you buy your books for school this year or your summer reading and that kind of stuff. We get a little taste of that money back, and you don't have to do anything. And then the cool people can click the PayPal button and make donations. That's right. Right now, here's the shout-out to Gordon 
Den Woody. That's the last name. I hope I pronounced it right because that's a pretty cool last name. Gordon Den Woody has recently contributed. Bonnie Frazier, Cameron Freeman, and Jason Stewart have all donated to the Homebrewed Christianity Podcast recently. This episode is dedicated to you, and we can dedicate one to you too soon when you click that PayPal button and make a little donation to help us cover all the, the fees and such that are incurred in uh, podcastery. All right, deacons, homebrewed Christianity deacons, put your theological safety belt on because Greg Horton and I are about to tell you what goes on under the hood as a minister, the things you don't ever hear about and you probably don't know about till you've been there. Booyah! Hello, homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip, and on the other end of the line is Greg Horton, ex-pastor extraordinaire, blogger at the parish, and um, a, a, a digital friend of mine that became fleshly in um, at my trip out to uh, Oklahoma, and and he, he was he was good enough to give me a hard time in front of a, a, a lubricated crowd there, and now he's, <laughs> he's back on the podcast because. Well, um, Greg Horton's one of the guys that it talked me into just with his sheer pressure into uh, in, into even doing podcasts back in the day. So, Greg, I'm glad that you are back on the podcast. I'm glad to be here, Trip. Thank you. Greg was on. People said, "Oh, I was all, th- that was really good because you two kind of just pushed back and forth with each other, and clearly were having fun and kind of uh, res- respecting each other while jousting and and that kind of thing, which is uh, uh, Greg and I both find." Um, kind of arguing and playing ideas out and seeing how things go uh, as an entertainment sport as well as something that's productive. So uh, I said, Greg, look, you were a minister, and then you left the church building. What, 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 what it, maybe we can do this as a top ten list. So, Greg, yes, what do you think? Well, I think that I, I liked the idea of doing this list because I have – when you spend as much time in the ministry as I did, which was about, you know, all told, I don't know, I, I left in 2006 and maybe started in 92. So on and off 14 years, uh, you built up a network of friendships and many of my really good friends are still in ministry. And so having sat down with them over the years and having been there myself at, in various capacities, I did youth ministry, singles, associate pastor, senior pastor. I did some ancillary work during the emergent, uh, you know, uh, crush when we were all trying to start some hip ass service. And so I've got, you know, quite a bit of experience in those areas and I still talk to my friends and I wanted to talk about these ten sort of things. And it's probably twenty five if I wanted to be serious about it, but these were the ones that were kind of biggies uh that stood out to me as when I when I first started the business, as I'm gonna keep calling it, um I just didn't expect this kind of stuff. I, I mean, they, they prepare you for a lot of things in seminary. Don't get me wrong. They, they, they're very, very good, especially if you have good professors. But some stuff, you just don't know until you're there. So yeah. that's kind of what we're talking about, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think it would be fun because we have uh, listeners who um, you know, are where you are, where I am, somewhere in between people thinking about getting into ministry or not, or people that never want to for good reasons, and they may have new ones after we get done. Um, yeah. Uh, but I, I think one of the fun things about doing something like this is, you know, it, 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 you know, a working minister probably isn't going to lift the hood up, right, 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 um, because well, it's how you pay your health insurance. But, but uh, Greg has no problem doing it and, and being honest during the process. So, uh, here we go, huh? Right, Greg. Yes. Number ten. You have no idea what's coming. And I mean that like this. When you work on staff for a while and you've been in seminary for a while, um, you, you, what you want to do is you want to be a pastor. And that's really, really what you want to do. You want to help people and you want to change lives. And um, I remember working in various staff capacities and my senior pastor saying to me, you really don't know what to expect from this job. I know he says, you know, I, I know you want it. I know you want to be a senior. And, and that's kind of one of the things I see today. It's not like we don't have sufficient number of churches in America that every young man or young woman that wants to be a senior pastor has to go off and plant their own church. And someone needs to say to them, you really don't know what's coming. You're going to be sitting there. You'll have the job that you thought you wanted, and you really won't know what to do once you have it. Um, because suddenly you're the one that's responsible and suddenly all the things that you thought you could do better than the guy that's ahead of you or the woman that's ahead of you, you can't do as well, or you, it's, it's harder than you thought. And the isolation and the loneliness that comes along in that moment 
are, are devastating. And so you begin the search for people you can trust and, and friends you can rely on and just someone in the congregation that you can admit your, you know, your shit to. And it, it's just so hard. And you, you really, his, his line was always, you're not going to understand until you sit behind the desk. And it's so completely true. And I so didn't believe it. And, and once I got there, I just felt completely isolated, even, even with good friends around me. And so that was, the, that was a biggie to me, was that you find yourself in a place where you are professionally dishonest, you professionally hide things. And even with peers, like other pastors of churches of similar size or larger or smaller, it doesn't matter, you would still you still lie and fudge and, and hedge and hide things. And so you just you can't really anticipate what this job is actually like until you have the job. And that's unfortunate because that's when you have to make the decision whether to stay in it or not. Yeah, and, and when you say that right now, right, I bet a lot of people that have been ministers are going – yeah, you know, I completely know what he's saying. I don't know if I'd use the word lie. Um, and then, and then the others are sitting there going, "Well, yeah, that's maybe true for Greg. He's not a Christian anymore, but my pastor, right now, you know, she's the one that doesn't do this, or you know, my youth minister, he blah 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 with a sweet goatee." So, um, maybe maybe you could say a bit about what was it like? Uh, maybe a, share a bit, maybe a story or something where all of a sudden the uh, the grubbiness of it, the dirtiness of having to do all this kind of set in for you. Because yeah. right now it would be easy, right? To, it would be like um, listening to people all complaining about Anthony Weiner and the scandals and stuff. And, right. and and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, well, that doesn't – that's kind of weird. He apologized. Let it go on. But a no, second time, oh, it's a problem. But there's a, the we think, oh, that's politicians. That's dirty. Mm-hmm. Um, I think no. one of the things happens when the hood pops – is you find that most things, specifically ones that runs off donations in a nonprofit setting, yeah, uh, it, the engine's not always the cleanest. Yeah, and that's you know, I, and I'm going to I only use the word lie because I, I'll fully admit that I, I engaged in the process myself, uh, and I, and at the time I probably didn't call it a lie. I probably called it you know some sort of necessity or I don't even know anymore. It's been it's been a long time since I felt like I had to do that, but. Uh, for example, structurally, some guys, some some men and women are in churches where the denomination insists on a certain number of metrics, and uh, I'm not an idiot. If everybody that had been saved in America had been saved as the churches claim, uh, we'd have everybody in America saved by now. And so the reality is that we we play with numbers and we fudge numbers all the time. I remember when I was a, a, I was working with the Nazarenes at one point. Now this is before that. I was writing a religion column for the Daily Oklahoman, and uh, a very well known uh, Nazarene pastor, and in fact became a general superintendent of the Nazarene Church, uh, made a, a claim that some absurd number, four billion or five billion people worldwide had seen the Jesus film. And so being kind of an ass, I called thirty five of my people that I had right off the top of my head and asked how many of them had seen the Jesus film. Because I figured 5 billion out of 6 billion have seen it. That means 5 out of 6 people I talked to, they've, they've seen the Jesus film, right? Uh, so I called 35 people, and guess what? None of them had seen it. So I write this up in a column, and he gets really, really upset, demands an apology from me. And it's like, I understand the necessity of justifying what it is that you do, but I also understand that this is supposed to be the pursuit of an honest life, of a truthful life. How's that? Um, and sometimes you just feel dirty when you have to do the things that you have to do. Sometimes you're dealing with congregants who want you to believe or say a certain thing. And in the moment, sometimes you just say the thing you got to say just to get the hell out of the office, just to go home, just to get the service over with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, and that's true like there about digits and stuff. But number nine on your list in attendance and things is that uh, clear thinking <laughs> is not valued. So it's also there in in even your critical thinking through the content of your faith or the story of your faith. That uh, that that you know your experience as a minister is that um, the kind of bastion of truth that's claiming ultimacy over all these congregants isn't a place clear thinking is valued. Come on, Greg, what's that? No, really, and and honestly, Trip, I want to say this unequivocally. I had a fantastic grad school experience. I had some uh, professors that I thought taught me uh, to think about things rigorously and, and honestly and, and to, to go ahead and confront my, my fears. And I even remember one of my mentors saying to me uh, as I was losing my faith one step at a time, that there will be a place along the way, even in the midst of these doubts, where you'll be okay. So they, they, they knew, and they, they embraced, and they didn't run from that. And they taught me a, a method of thinking that um, 
in, in, insists on answers that are sincere and honest and forthright. And so what happens then is you get into a congregation where they don't really want clear thinking. They want to think what they want to think, and they want to make you feel pretty good about Make make them feel pretty good about how they feel. I remember when Brian McLaren first did his uh, the first new kind of Christian book, and he said part of his job. This was in the intro, I believe, and I'll paraphrase that part of what he found frustrating was that you get to you get to a place where you can see that the words that you use function as a massage on people rather than something that prods them or, or provokes them. Because when you begin to provoke your congregants, what they don't want you to do is make them question or doubt. Now, yes, every church probably has five or six that will argue with you and fight, and they're not afraid of that. But as a rule, clear thinking, no, they don't want to talk, they don't want to think rigorously about the Bible or the complications with it or the application to life. I remember when I was a Nazarene for a little while, and, you know, I've always been a big fan of beer and wine, especially wine, and uh, trying to talk to a group of Nazarenes about Jesus drinking four glasses of wine during a Seder is not very fruitful. I've got to tell you, they don't want to hear that. Because many of them have never had an experience with alcohol, and the idea that their Lord and Savior drank four glasses of wine, which that's a bottle, by the way, and you can't get shit-faced and not drink about what you're drinking a bottle. You mean you're going to get drunk. Uh, they just didn't want to deal with that. And it's like, I have a problem with a group that is fundamentally opposed to looking at an issue like that and being able to say, okay, what we believe isn't necessarily right, so what are the implications of what's being said now? How do we, how do we parse now rather than... You know, if, if I if I if I stop believing this one thing, and all of a sudden everything's not true. It was just a really bizarre experience to run into people who refused to think through the implications of what they were supposed to believe. Mm -hmm. it, it may be the the idea that they were wanting you to help them think clearly or critically is the problem, because I think a lot of times the same thing about them finding out that you are constantly having to play this politic game with the denomination and stats and stuff, and the same about what you believe or don't believe and stuff that a lot of times um, congregants don't know how many versions of themselves exist in the other congregants' heads and that you are sitting there knowing that the actual attendance and bottom line of the church determines whether or not you're still there. So um, a lot of times what we would think of in the abstract, if you're not a minister, is critically thinking about a text so you can come up with you know a way that it impacts your life or calls into question certain commitments or practices of your life or something like that, uh, you at the same time are managing um, all these images of you and expectations of you that exist in this giant organization that uh, sometimes is labeled the church. Right, and we'll get. To, I mean, we'll get more of that when we get to number four. Quite frankly. Oh well, don't don't do it. Let's not hurry up. Say that loud. But, no. Yeah, we'll do more of that when we get to number four because that really does become a function of who you are, and it's really problematic. I, again, I want to say this. I have friends who are pastors. I have great sympathy for them. I have great respect for, for a few of them what they do because they try to be honest and, and forthright, and they try to, to be clear thinkers. They try to hold their congregation's hand and bring them along. So I don't say this in any way to, to be negative about what they do. I'm simply saying that you find yourself, once you're in ministry, in a place where you have to figure out how you stay alive in that job once all these sort of factors become apparent to you. Mm -hmm. Well, it really, it all comes down to love, Greg, because God <laughs> is love. And, <laughs> and you're promoing number three. Or number eight. Number eight, because we're counting right, down sir. to the okay. most exciting part. So number eight, love has an ambiguous definition. I thought it has a real definition. It's called oh, Jesus. Jesus. He is love. And God is love. First John says so. Um, that's Here's the problem. Okay, so I don't even know how to define that word anymore. You know, a couple of, of, of classes with Wittgenstein as the as the primary read, uh, you, you learn that definitions are slippery things that are often defined uh, locally or culturally as opposed to, you know, some sort of grand definition. But in Christianity especially, no, that's not fair. Let's just, let's just not make generalizations. Uh, in, in the churches that I worked in and the Christians that I'm around, they don't know what to do with that word. Uh, it, it becomes this sort of... Um, I can do whatever I want because God loves me or Jesus loves me. But if we talk about, and that, that kind of love is, by the way, relentless and accepting and always forgiving and all of that. And then, and, then, and, then to turn, and then to turn that around and, uh, and talk about how we ought to love or what our responsibility is. And then, quite frankly, how the congregation is supposed to love their pastor becomes problematic as well. Nancy Murphy, who uh, at Fuller Theological Seminary taught, you know, teaches philosophy of science and stuff. And I remember um, when... Uh, she, 
I, I believe uh, Steve Green, my, one of my mentors at Southern Nazarene, said when he was a student there, she had a sign on her door that said, when Jesus said to love your enemy, he at least meant don't kill him. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, and that seems to me a good starting place. Yeah. But it's you know that's like the most minimalist definition of all time, and so they it really... is. It's also one of the more offensive ones because it it's explicit, right? Like, yeah, my I got my dad that bumper sticker because he used to make we would make jokes about that line that like you know when Jesus said love your enemy, I'm pretty sure he didn't mean bomb them. Right. Like, exactly. I saw the bottom that bumper sticker, and you know he was a minister at the time, and uh, uh, it, it's a conversation starter to say the least. We were we were going into um, trying to think. I mean, it was probably my first pastorate, so I think it was we were going into the first Gulf War. And I remember, and I'm not. I was not a pacifist per se. I probably leaned that way, uh, but at the, at the, in these days, I probably wasn't a full on pacifist, which I became later when I started reading Anabaptist work. But in those days, I probably wasn't. But I at least had a sense that things were awry. Uh, politically in the country and other 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 issues, and I remember one of my congregants, who's also my friend, came to me and wanted to know why I hadn't spoken up in, in support of the Gulf War, and I said, "Well, I have a real hard, I have a hard time. Uh, I understand just war is a necessary evil, and I have a really hard time trying to parse what it means for Christians to love enemies if we're, you know, for you know, simultaneously bombing or shooting at them." And he said, "And, I, and I'm not making this up, and this kind of goes with clear thinking too. I, I will love them up to the point that I have to kill them." And I have no idea what that even means. And that he said it out loud to this day, I'd still be fuddled by it. And so, I love them up to the point where I have to kill them. Yeah, that's that's like, well, that's what a soldier has to do, right? Oh, he can okay. Pray for them, and then up to that point, he has to kill them. And it's like, I, I would like to talk to your girlfriend or your wife because your definition of love is quite frightening, as a matter of fact. Um, so, so it's that sort of ambiguity about how we define the word. But they also, it's like a they, stand your ground law. <laughs> Where it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, retreat well, up to a point. Or standard, no, it's I, 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 it's problematic for me because when they start talking about loving their pastor, what that generally means, okay, again, I'm going to try to be fair here. They will love and support you up to the point that you make them feel really uncomfortable. And at that point, the, the ambiguity of love's definition begins to kick in. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and you know, there's tons of social scientific data that uh, – when it goes to like life expectancy, uh, quality of life, and things, um, that, that being a full time minister is not uh, at the top of the list. No, highly stressful, uh, very very um, exhausting. Uh, you know, you've seen all the numbers that talk about how their families fare and how they do health wise. It's just that the congregation has the ability, if they will commit to the pastor, to love her or him to the point where they're allowed to. Uh, say things and to make mistakes and to challenge thinking and to be somewhat political uh, in the best sense of the word. I read recently that uh, after the Trayvon Martin, um, what was the one sentence? Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, I guess Ms. George Zimmerman's uh, acquittal. Uh, Christianity Today ran a little online poll. I don't know if you saw it. How many how many churches talked about the, the verdict at that Sunday service, which was like you know a couple of days later? And, and no, it was when, the next day. Like was it came it, okay. out on Saturday because I was preaching on Sunday. Yeah, there you go. And so, you are sitting there as a minister going, OMG, I got what, a sermon, Yeah. but now what? Yeah. So at the last time I saw it, I don't remember even how many responses there were, only 5% of, of people who responded. Now, of course, this is an evangelical website, so we're playing yeah, with yeah. A, a different demographic. But only 5% of people responded to their pastor and said anything at all about it. Um, and that, I find that a little distressing, quite frankly, Um because I, I think that you have to be able to say those sorts of things to, to your congregation and, and at least try to contextualize it or, or, or at least say, let's pray for peace or, you know, let's hope that whatever, say something. Um, mm. But the fact is you're never sure what you're going to say that is going to turn the definition of love on its head where, where, where the congregation feels about you. I, I frankly didn't have a whole lot of trouble with this, but I've seen it happen to a, a, a good friend's brother uh, who tried to get a little too political. Which I, and I thought he was absolutely right to do so, and they, they ran him out. And so love is really a strange word when it also means, yeah, when we're done with you, we're going to kick your ass out. But, but remember, because this is important, number seven, you're a minister, you work for Jesus, and Jesus only has one <laughs> job. <laughs> Saving. Is to save me. I this this is the if I had any hair, 
this would be the most hair-pulling part of this whole thing. Uh, it is what they have, the most reductionistic approach I've ever seen to the Lord of the Universe. Um, that they can simultaneously call him God and then assume that his one job seems to be, at least therapeutically, uh, to save you from yourself or your sins or from hell or whatever con- whatever you know whatever construct you believe. I, I, it's it's never anthropological model. I even just recently, uh, I remember uh, hearing a pastor. Here's here's the, here's my dirty little secret. Sometimes on Sunday mornings, I get up and I watch sermons online, uh, only because I'm relig- I, I teach religion. I'm trying to keep you know keep a pulse of what's going on. And I heard once a pastor say recently, uh, Jesus doesn't show us what to do. He is he exists for the salvation of our sins, so he doesn't show us what to do. Well, then why the hell write a book? I mean, what is the point of the entire Sermon on the Mount if it's not to show us what to do? If all that exists for us to show us that we need grace, I, I'm sorry. Most of my life I've figured that out without five, you know, three chapters in the Bible. So this idea that his job is only to save me, not to lead me or to challenge me or to you know, teach a different ethic or a different standard, uh, this is really bizarre. And it's, it goes to what Christian Smith calls that you know, moralistic therapeutic deism. Mm-hmm. Where you know there is this God and He likes me and wants me to be happy, uh, and so uh, He doesn't really intervene in your being too much, but He has some rules that I ought to follow. Unless they get really too hard, and then I don't follow them anymore because He really wants me to be happy. Well, and and where this comes from, right? Not just in the external critique where you're sitting now, but this is a real frustration for ministers sitting at board meetings and preaching sermons and planning worship and visiting people in crisis and talking to church members who are in positions of power and privilege. And um, when uh, most people, right, that go to seminary and then decide to go into church or someone that fell in love with the Sermon on the Mount or this vision of prophetic social justice or this uh, radical practice of reconciliation or a, a eschatological banquet where everyone is able to be reconciled and present. I mean, what drives most ministers and makes you want to deal with all the BS that you end up dealing with is usually a gospel that's so much bigger than an individual saving me. So right. maybe you can say a bit about wh- wh- how, because, you know, wh- your commitment you mentioned before grew and that be- inspired by Anabaptists. How did your kind of wrestling with your faith and how you, the broadening of the gospel past that, get sabotaged or destroyed in? As a minister, it seems like that's the place where you're like, no, no, Jesus said, come on, let's, come on, team, woohoo, missional. <laughs> you know, I, here's, here's, okay, and I do this in class too, because, you know, I teach in Oklahoma, and in Oklahoma, one in four people that you encounter is a Baptist of some sort, mainly Southern, but we've also got your, your traditional Black Baptist churches and Free Will Baptist. So a good percentage of my college students, and I teach freshmen and sophomores, uh, are, are uh, of some form of evangelical Christian, even fundamentalist. And I find it really frustrating if we're talking about an ethical system, you know, or if we're talking about uh, the, the foundation of Christianity. Because I teach religion, I teach ethics, whatever. Um, and you start using the phrase Jesus said, it becomes the most unusual sort of way to parse the Bible. Uh, because I'll ask them, does the founder of your faith have more weight in terms of the importance of his words than, say, Moses or the Apostle Paul? And they will initially say, well, maybe, maybe not. They're not sure because it feels like a trap, and it is a trap. But you get to the point where you have to decide, and this is what the Anabaptists helped me do, and I think this is what the church, if they're going to survive at all with any degree of uh, credibility intact, has got to figure out that if you're going to say that this guy is the God of the universe and is the founder of your faith, then whatever he says has far more weight than what anybody else says. Now, this yes. is, of course, this is an interpretive issue that, you know, churches will fight about forever, but there's no way to make sense of that gigantic-ass book if you don't find some way to parse it. And so the, the lens the Anabaptists gave me was, it's Jesus. And so when you ask students or you ask your congregants, so when Jesus says don't resist evil or don't resist an evil person, what do you think he means? And I had a young man tell me just last semester, well, I've never heard anybody in my church talk about this. You've never heard anybody talk about Jesus and that whole speech about evil and turning the other cheek. No, nope, never heard that sermon at all. How the hell do you live 18 years of your life and not hear one of the, the, the foundational ethical principles of Christianity? How about love your enemy? Did you hear that sermon? No, he hadn't heard that sermon either, except to forgive people who are mean to you. Oh, see? Uh, It's like, okay, here's the deal. 
I, it, it occurred to me that if I was going to be a Christian, and honestly, in all fairness, the Anabaptists helped me hang on for a few years longer. Uh, if I was going to be, be able to be a Christian, then there had to be some sort of sensible rubric under which I could do ethics. And that that doesn't mean it has to be sensible and that, like it's easy or I can apply it today, but it had to be consistent with what I was seeing in, in the context of Jesus as anthropological model. Because why the hell is he living this entire life if all he needs to do is really, he, he can come as a baby, be killed as a baby, and, and the blood's there and God's happy, he's like, blood, and everything good yeah but clearly there's something about the life that matters yeah yeah well and and when it goes to ecclesiology right it seems that the whole image one of paul's images is christ as the head of the church means i mean generally the head is where the talking takes place <laughs> and hopefully the thinking as well yeah, so the you know what what he said might matter um but number six come on it's all about power sex and abuse really uh, come on and I had to throw this one You're in. You're a hater. Here's, you know, Jesus is crying. They tell you, they t- and, I'll, and I'll be honest, they tell you in pastoral care and counseling, they tell you in all kinds of different classes that you're going to have to be careful um, because when, once you have power, you're going to be tempted to abuse it. And that is totally true. I mean, it's always going to be true. And I'm, anyone that's, any, even in a secular job, uh, if you have too much power, you've seen, you know, what, what a manager can can do to a company. Or a, I worked for a megalomaniac alcoholic at one point in a sportswear manufacturer. And they can damage it too. So this isn't just, you know, endemic to the church. It's everywhere. But what they didn't tell me was this, and this is why I put this in here. At some point in your career, somebody's going to try to have sex with you. Period. At some point in your career, if you're a pastor, you're going to get close to someone. You're going to be doing counseling. You're going to be working hand-in-hand with. You're going to be spending time with. You're going to have intimate moments with. And at some point, they're going to try to transition that relationship into a sexual relationship. And if you aren't prepared for that, it is going to kick your ass. Yeah. And quite frankly, uh, it kicked my ass. Uh, one of the reasons I stopped being a pastor in the first place was that my uh, the, the woman who became my wife, who was actually uh, a member of my church, we had that, that relationship that went from being people working really hard to, to you know love the church and love God to people who really liked each other too much to people who did things they ought not do. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it ended up being destructive to the church overall. And so, uh, but no one had ever said to me, no, really, this person is going to want to have sex with you and even try to. It's like, no, I thought I was going to be the problem, right? I'm going to be the one that has to watch myself and not be tempted and, and not say the wrong thing. No one ever said, oh, yeah, they're going to be aggressive and assertive about this. And they are. Oh, yeah. And I think that, I mean, that's one of the conversations that if you hang out with ministers, um, one of the reasons they like going to other events where there are ministers is where you can actually talk about that, right? Like if you just talk to your friend at your church, hey, so-and-so is, you know, I, I'm c- feeling kind of awkward about this. Uh, um, you know, that that's not that's not always heard in the best way, right, if your minister is telling you that <laughs> they're concerned right. about this. So, well, And you have a confidentiality issue, too. I can't talk to someone like one of my deacons or somebody like that because I'm talking about a woman. And if you're a female pastor, you're talking about a man in the church. I, I, so you have these issues where – and you also have the, – not, not only can you not talk about it, it's just the really nasty part of the secret here is that that feels really damn good. Somebody wants me. That's a fantastic feeling because there's a lot of times in that job you don't feel wanted at all. And there's a lot of times with your wife or your husband at home who you've not spent enough time with and there's been some, some downside in the relationship and, and you're trying to work through stuff, uh, that, that that moment of being wanted, that sort of attraction, that thing is the thing that gets you back into the office the next day or gets you to worship practice or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, so it becomes this sort of you know twin thing where you know what's happening is not right, but it feels good. You're not going to stop doing it. Yeah, and, and ministers are human. Right. In case, if you've never been one, just remember, we ain't Jesus. <laughs> no, and, it's, and I feel for them in that area because they are painfully human. And I would love, we used to talk about this when I was a pastor too. How amazing would it be for a pastor to be able to stand up one day in front of his congregation and say, here are the lists, here is the list of things that really screw with me. And rather than, you know, them think there's something wrong with him, they just agree to love him and love her pray for her and support them. I mean, that would be Why fantastic. would you want, why, what makes you think confessing your sins one to another is a good idea? <laughs> well, because it's James and it's only going to throw that book out. Look, the next thing you're going to tell me is that uh, you will need to be political. And we all know <laughs> that religion and politics are separated. Yeah. Number five. In our Christian country. 
if when you leave, and I guess, I don't know if everybody was this way, I'm a bit of an idealist. I mean, people accuse me of being a cynic or a skeptic all the time, and I'm clearly skeptical in the old sense of the word, but I'm really an idealist. I really believe that people can do better and be better. Uh, I believe that you could sit down and have a conversation and arrive at a consensus or at least the truth. In that way, if someone's not happy, they're not happy because they don't like facts. Whatever. And I, I believed all of that. I was such an idiot. Um, so what I found out was you have to be political. You have to trade this for that. You have to not fight this battle so you can win that one later on. You have to make sure that this group is not upset with that group. You have to do all of these things where it's like, can I just can I just give this job to somebody else where they can take care of all that stuff and I can just preach and pray and visit sick people and, and do the things that I really wanted to do when I was in ministry, which was like take care of people. But the fact is that for people in your church who give more money or have more power, who've been there longer, uh, will exert more influence than you realize. And one person with a small following can create a tremendous amount of difficulty for you. And what you can't do, and this is the hard part, is you can't just throw people away because they become problematic. So you have to learn to be, and I say political there, and I mean it in both ways. You have to learn to be political about it, but you also have to learn to be diplomatic about it. And you have to absolutely follow the rule, which is you have to love people even if they don't love you back. And it sucks. I hated it because they're, they, people are one of the one of the, when we were talking about this original idea. One of the people on Facebook said, "You need to tell them that sheep have teeth, and they do, and they bite, and they, and they can be really, really painful. Uh, and you have to learn to be political about that in the best sense of the word. In other words." You know, the science of getting along. How can I get along with these people? But in the larger sense, yes, you have to take care of this group or that deacon versus this deacon or this rich family versus that rich family. And, and if you think you can do the job without doing that, you're just going to be carved up. Yes. I, and here's a, there's, I think there's two, like, kind of straining tensions in that, right? Like, one is if you're too much of an idealist, then you will be turned into lamb chop. And yep. then the other is... That if you realize that and enjoy the game, you could turn into the prince. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, maybe you could say a bit about that. Like, what is it like to sit? Here's um, a perfect example. Ready? So, we, I, I was I was always kind of a I was a kind of consensus leader. I always liked to have I had a group of of, of elders. We called them male and female, and I and I liked to get input in these larger meetings. There were probably ten of them, uh, and we would sit there in the office on a Saturday night, uh, and we would talk about stuff and pray, of course, and and, and I was working in, at the time, I'd become senior pastor at this, uh, which we would call a middle-of-the-road charismatic evangelical church, and we weren't like, you know, word of faith charismatic. It was very much a, a sort of milder form uh, of, of worship. That wouldn't put a whole lot of people off, but some it did. And so we had a couple of visitors come that uh, a couple of our friends who liked to pray in tongues, as they call it. I don't even know if that's real or not. Whatever. They call it praying in tongues. Uh, we're doing it in the middle of the service. And so at this, at this elder meeting, we're having this conversation about what ought we to do in terms of charismatic worship in the service. And this is not like new to the Bible. I mean, Paul deals with the issue itself. And I felt like, as the, as the pastor, you know, I had a couple of elders on my side that on the Sunday services, especially Sunday mornings, we should defer to this sort of hospitality and just welcome people and not freak them out by the way we did, you know, what we did worship. And if we wanted to do Wednesday night or Sunday night thing that was a little more over the top, then, then that's fine. Dance in the aisles, do what you want, shout hallelujah, speak in tongues. I just didn't care. But I thought under this sort of principle of hospitality and evangelism, we would leave Sunday mornings free. And I thought we would reach a consensus on that because you're trying to give out pieces, right? So we're going to get Sunday mornings and you're going to have Sunday night and Wednesday night. And I had a, content, a, a faction within the elders who said, well, that's not fair. You're limiting our worship on Sunday mornings mornings. And they really refused to yield on that issue. And two of them ultimately left the church over it. Uh, and there's literally, there's, there's like nothing you can do at that point because someone wants all or nothing. And it's a painful thing to have to do. And I, I talked to them and I met with them. And I tried to keep them there. I tried to make them see it was reasonable. Again, clear thinking. Uh, you can't have everything that you want. Politics means compromise at times. And we're not compromising the gospel. We're just trying to find a way to make people feel comfortable until they get to know who we are. Mm -hmm. And they would not hear it, and they and, and I and they left the church open. And and one of the things that, if you're a minister, things become aware. You become aware of enough stuff that a lot of times when you're having these kind of political encounters, um, you figured out over time as a minister reading people, but also knowing a lot more than anyone else in the conversation does about people's lives and situations and stuff. A lot of times you're you're it's like you're sitting in the. I can't remember who told the story, but this idea that you pull together a whole, like, the council jungle, the jungle council, and, and which animals are allowed, and, and then all of a sudden they're having a whole me meeting. 
and they're trying they're like look this tiger has agreed not to eat anyone so <laughs> little lamb who is upset you just have to get over it because you know we want to be hospitable well that's fine if it's a if it eats plants but sometimes like you have to realize no 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 this is a tiger and you're just not going to have a peaceful little jungle council with a tiger in it and everyone else is on his uh you know menu yeah that's and, right and, and it's just difficult because it's not like you can go, ah, oh, yes, you don't know this. Uh, he was at two other churches previously, and I know one of the ministers, and, and this is kind of how it played out. And uh, and we're also concerned about, blah, blah, blah. you know, you're, you're kind of stuck in a position trying to help people get to good decisions. And, uh, and then you feel dirty knowing all that stuff and trying to, you know, <laughs> work yeah. magic and such. Yeah. And try to, I mean, you really try to love everybody in the room. And, and and try not to, to be too harsh in the way you, you, you deal with people. But every, every once in a while you get someone, and Tiger's a good word, they're just pugnacious. They don't want to yield. They don't want to play along. They don't want to be fair. They simply want what they want. And I don't know, and, that's, and, and it's frustrating for me because you're talking about the practice of the faith for which meekness is a huge, huge virtue. And, and, and they've lost sight of that. And, of course, you know, I have my issues with this new muscular Christianity, neo-reform nonsense. Uh, but that kind of avoids this entire issue of how meekness factors into the relationships we ought to have with each other. Uh, and, I, again, that probably, can, that probably segues to, the, to, to three, but we're not there yet. So. Uh, but number four. Right. You're a prop. You're a prop. Who uh, is? The pastor. Oh. You are a prop. And I mean this in every sense of the word. You are occasionally there to prop people up, to help them, to carry them along, to, to carry the wounded. And that is the, one of the best parts of the job. It really is. If you love people, man, you're going to have plenty of opportunity for that. But the flip side of being a prop is that you aren't Greg, and you're not Trip, and you're not Melanie, and you're not any of these people. You are, you are a role, a function. You are there to, to end a dispute. You're there to save a marriage. You're there to uh, preach the Bible the, the correct way. Uh, your identity is reduced to to a function, and you become not just a fully, fully fleshed out, three-dimensional human being with your own thoughts and feelings and concerns and fears and inadequacies. You are this, uh, this, this role, this stock character in someone else's drama, and they don't give a shit uh, as, in, until you make them feel uncomfortable. The, 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 your job is to do whatever they think your job is to do. So like any kind of prop on a movie set, you become that sort of two-dimensional character, and that is your job, and don't forget what your job is. Yeah, and, 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 and the thing is, like, if you're not a minister and hear that, um, it may sound weird, but that's actually because pretty quickly in ministry – these kinds of things, maybe not as intense as Greg's experience, but they become clear, and you have to decide whether or not you want to deal with it, right? Yeah. Like, I have a lot of friends that were at one church for two or three years and then decided, you know, I'm going to do CPE because I actually like the whole ministering to humans part when they yeah. need help and listening, caring, and, and that kind of stuff, but the whole being a prompt thing and blah, blah, blah. Like, the politicking, the all that's, all the... Uh, institutional uh, yeah. fidelity you have to have over your own well-being, health, spiritual development, and such. Like, um, it, it, it's just kind of part of the job, and you have to figure out how much of it you can tolerate or not. And and does yeah. knowing you're doing it? Because I've met ministers that don't know. It's like they think it would be weird to be themselves as yeah. a follower of Christ at the same time as being a minister. And they don't see it consciously as odd. They just think, well, no, I'm a minister, so I'm a prop. Right. And it's, it's, it's a pain. Again, friends in the church, tons of them in ministry, love what they do. I love them. I feel for them because I, I never felt like I could breathe until I left the church. And that is a tragic thing to realize, is that it took me walking out the door to be able to breathe and think, I'm really me. And I, I wrote. I was writing the other night, and one of the things I wrote, just as I was taking notes, probably had too much wine. Uh, I, I said, "The church has never let me feel like I'm who I'm supposed to be." At no point in, in do I remember in ministry. And most of the time I spent in church, I spent in ministry. At no point did I feel like I, I was who I was supposed to be. Now, and that's not to say I can't get better or, or smarter or kinder, or, you know, grow in holiness, whatever the phrases you want to use. But just to feel okay with just being me. 
That never happened, especially in ministry, because you were everything is scrutinized, everything is up for grabs and discussion, and and you always feel like there's something you're doing wrong, and there there can be, there can be other better ways to do things and other and better ways to be. And it was a painful realization when I walked out. And I remember a friend asked me shortly after I left the church and the faith, "How do you feel?" I said, "Well, I feel like I have more time on Sundays, but for the most part, I feel really, really good, really good." Mm-hmm. So, uh, and this is going to come as a shock because you were at a Nazarene church, which they believe in the Bible. Yes. But you think you had a problem that people don't really care what the Bible says. They they don't care what the Bible says. But they I'm believe still, the Bible. Yeah. Or Bible. It's a Bible believing. <laughs> yeah. All, all the denominations I worked for were Bible believing. I worked for a Baptist church too, um, and, and so and I worked for an evangelical church. So they don't care what the Bible says until they care what the Bible says. Well, you, you know what's funny is if you um, eventually become uncomfortable with certain things in the evangelical community, or you grow up in the main line, if you hang out there. Um, they, they, they don't have so much of that sensibility. They just go, "Wow, that's what the Bible says." That's <laughs> really <laughs> they, they go, "This is great. Where did this come from?" <laughs> I, you, you even talked about it in your sermon. Yeah, not, yeah. W- not one reference to an Oprah book club book. I, uh, this is. <laughs> No, I, 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 lo- I read the book. Okay, I'm, this is this is. I'll be. I'll do a humble brag here. Um, you know, you know, most of the people that know me know that I spent a good bit of time in prison for robbing a bank. And in that four and a half year period that I was in, I, I, I know I read the New Testament 30 or 40 times. And I know I read the Old Testament another dozen or more. Um, and, I, and I left th- that experience, uh, and that's when I first started ministry as soon as I got out, which was 1992. Um, and, I, and I kept reading, and I kept reading, and, and I don't know what I thought was going to happen. I, I guess I, in those days I had some sort of mystical Pentecostal idea that, you know, the Holy Spirit would illuminate certain passages and I would understand it differently and all that stuff that goes along with mysticism. But what did happen was that I really learned what the hell the thing says. Uh, now, that is, that's not the same thing as what it means, but I at least knew what it says. Uh, and so when I would talk to congregants or people in my youth group or even students today, they have no idea what's in that book. They have not a clue, no idea. And so when I, I will start going through different passages, what I find is if I say something like, and here's, here's, okay, here's the, the calculus I use. I'll write two verses on the board. I'll write the verse in Leviticus 18 about a man should not lie with a man as with a woman uh, as an abomination. And I'll write Jesus from Matthew, I think it's uh, five, maybe six, uh, do not resist an evil person. And then I'll ask them to apply the same sort of, you know, uh, hermeneutical grid uh, that they do uh, with, with, to both verses. And what ends up happening is they don't really care about the second verse. They care a lot about the first verse. So that's what I mean. They don't really care what the Bible says until they care what it says. Once it impacts their life or once it becomes important to their system of beliefs, then they give a shit what it says. Up until that point, they just don't care. They're going to do what they want to do for the most part. I think most people will sin comfortably uh, as long as there aren't a whole lot of repercussions. Mm-hmm. So, go ahead. No, so uh, here's a question. So it, so I, I think there would be plenty of people that listen to the podcast because clearly you waste time right, listening to nerds talk about religion. It probably means you're a critical thinker, like right. uh, regardless if you're a, a Christian or not or in ministry or not. And and they'll go, yeah, okay, Greg, uh, I get that. They, they don't care what the Bible says. Um, well, it will, uh, And it, so what point did you go from, let's say, like, a kind of Kierkegaard response that, you know, actually just this is, uh, or maybe Bart or someone like that who's just looking at it going, well, you know, they think they're Christians or whatever. They're just not because they're not actually being faithful or disturbed or, or, or in some way being judged and called to transformation by what's the, the gospel and the broad, deep justice seeking sense and wanting you to be a whole full person like be really be who you're supposed to be and yourself and loved and all that kind of stuff like at what point do you go um as someone who you know has this bigger vision of the gospel and has thought through critically your faith and stuff when when did the when did you get to critiquing you know the church as an institution and stuff but then also turning to just judging the faith like okay well i get why i would want to be one but who actually still wants to be one other than, like, the 40 ministers I hung out with who feel like shit for working at a church? Yeah. Like, you know, tell me, because it seems like there's two places. One, you're being critical of the church and are invested in, you know, the church really becoming the church. Right. And then that, that kind of idealist side. And then going, no, no, no. If uh, poop comes out, what went in? 
Right. Like, at what point do you go, they probably aren't eating a healthy diet anymore? Yeah. I Okay. So <laughs> that's a great question. I, I think I... I was aware of a problem with trying to read the Bible as a univocal document from the very beginning. Never made much sense. And I had the great good fortune, quite frankly, to have a prison chaplain who did his uh, his undergrad at Seton Hall and his graduate work at Drew, and he was Af- African Methodist Episcopal, and he was clearly just different and wonderful, and he helped me with some of those sorts of problems. And yet I still loved the text itself, and I still felt like, and I still do, quite frankly, I'll say this out loud as, as a skeptic and as a non-Christian, I think the text, rightly read and understood, has the power to transform someone's life. I really believe that. Again, we're back to the hermeneutical lens you want to choose, but you got to pick something. So let's, let's go with that. But the point at which I started critiquing the church is when I realized that the church— um, was more in, in, more interested in this sort of uh, appropriation of cultural norms and this sort of smoothing the feathers of of even evangelicalness than it was in actually leading these kind of radically transformed lives. And I realized I was kind of an asshole about it because my experience coming out of prison was that we had been a very small minority of Christians in, in a larger environment that is absolutely hostile to the gospel. And so when I hear these churches, they talk about persecution, and I think about China and Vietnam, it's like so fucking idiotic. But I, 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 and I can be a bit of an ass about it in terms of that sort of what the church didn't realize was that they, they weren't challenging the culture except in two areas, homosexuality and abortion. And in every other area, they had caved into the culture and a Constantinian sort of ethic had taken over and they had become the thing that dominated and, and dictated what the culture was. So when I, that, when I was aware of that, then what I wanted to do was take the Bible, especially the prophetic tradition in which Jesus stands firmly and, and apply the prophetic tradition to the church itself. Well, that raises a lot of hackles, both in ministry and in congregants. And I wanted to do this gently. I honestly did. Now, if you go back and read the early parish entries, I wasn't all that gentle. I've always been a little bit sarcastic, and, and I've always thought satire was great, and, and Mark Twain was always one of my heroes. I appreciate that about you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that about me, too. I think everybody, you, you and my mom probably the only two. Um, but no, I, I, and that's what I wanted to do. But I still believe that this book is in many ways remarkable. Uh, one of the things I want to work on going forward in the future is this uh, a skeptic defends the Bible sort of thing, because I'm past weary of my Christian students not even being able to apply a fundamental ethic of Christianity in the conversations that we have about ethics. It's like, what the hell kind of church did you grow up in that you don't even begin to understand the Sermon on the Mount? That is, that is to me a catastrophic failure of not only Christian education, but of just sheer on discipleship. Where the fuck are the mentors? Who are, who's teaching these kids that to, to, to be a Christian means not believing the right set of shit? Who cares what you believe? It's to live into an ethic that, that ultimately seeks justice and, and, and restoration and redemption in the world. Yeah. I, I, I resonate with the frustration, and I actually know lots of ministers that do. One of the one of my favorite parts about the podcast um, is that it becomes a way that a lot of ministers or just people that used to be ministers, actually, there are plenty of those, and uh, and kind of critical thinking Christians um, are like, oh, I love listening to your podcast when no one's around that way because, you know, I don't normally get to be honest and think out loud to these ideas. And I was so excited when I found a couple other people that listened. They saw my my my, my homebrewed sticker and they said, oh, you like the podcast? And now we get together and talk about it. And um, and to me, there's, I mean, well, and that's sad, but um, that that these are people who've kind of um, given their life to working in churches and yeah. to the faith and then who don't feel like the actual place they're, in, you know, giving their life to is a place that where their life is growing and changing right. can, can belong. And, to, and so, you know, I, I think... Uh, one of the most interesting things about this conversation is how many that listen that aren't ministers <laughs> will all of a sudden hear what it's like <laughs> to yeah. a one. Let me take a tangent here really quickly, but I've got a couple of good friends that are still Nazarene, and I know that one of them has absolutely fundamentally altered what he talks about in terms of the way he approaches it, because what happens to pastors when they get in that job is that, that fear becomes a, a constant companion. Um, and this will actually segue very nicely into the next the next point. But you, I've I always wanted to start this kind of ex ministry. I mean, this ministry for ex pastors, because 
you're so afraid in that job that you've been so trained to do a specific task that you can't do anything else. And so you, you need to keep that job and keep that sort of calling in that direction. And that's fine if it's just a vocational sort of thing and that's what you want to do. But to be afraid of losing the job because you feel like there's no other options is not true. The things that make you a good pastor, communication skills, consensus building, dealing with people, compassion, uh, multi-talented, multitasking, all of those things make you good for a hundred different jobs out there. Yeah, and, and people should get that. Like, actually, Greg, how many? Um, I, I've had congregants say, "So, what actually do you do during the week?" <laughs> and I sit there and think to myself, like, I know some ministers who hit cruise control a long time ago, yeah. after so many years, and they do the pastoral stuff and repeat sermons. But um, the uh, if you're good at being a minister, mm-hmm. you actually could make more money. And doing a lot, a lot of other places. That's exactly right. So it may just say a little bit about that because number two in, on your list is that your life is a triage clinic. And yeah. part of it actually has to do with this um, r- constantly being aware of how, uh, in a sense, overspent and underappreciated you are. Because until you are a minister, you don't know what right. it's like to be one. Well, and there's, this, go, this cuts two ways. And by the way, I want to give Todd Littleton credit for the phrase triage clinic because I was describing a reality to him a couple weeks ago at lunch. And for those that don't know, Todd is a Baptist minister here in Oklahoma and a good friend of mine. And one of the guys that's really, after I left the building, as he likes to call it, one of the guys that's really supported me and we remain friends, uh, you know, and and we, we both know how each other feels about our different yeah. sort of, you know, and, and Trent knows us, but yeah, so you know what I mean. And Todd, so, if you were a homebrew person who was, uh, recently did the Peter Rollins and I high gravity class, yeah. Todd was the third person, the one that ran it and collected the questions and fixed all the tech stuff. He's also a minister at a, you know, a, a large and successful Baptist church and, and a wonderfully compassionate person who also has a bigger brain than any Southern Baptist minister I know. Ever, ever. No, really. Okay, so we're talking at lunch, and I, I had told him these last few weeks, uh, I teach college and write, for those that don't know, and I, and I got up some mornings, and I was trying to figure out what I needed to worry about today. And it occurred to me that for the first time in my life, I turned 49 three days ago, that for the first time in my life, I got up and I didn't really have a checklist of worries, that I didn't know, I wasn't responsible for anyone's emotional health. And don't get me wrong, I have two daughters, I care about them, I worry about them on a regular basis like any father would, and I have friends, and I have a job, and I have jobs actually, but to, to have an active worry, you know, like, okay, so before today's over with, I'm going to have to deal with X, that's something that pastors do every damn day. You get up and you try to figure out which one of your patients needs the most help at the right moment, and that's the triage clinic. So part of the triage is for your congregation. And so you don't get up any particular morning, and even if you're off that day, even if it's Monday and the adrenaline rush is over and you've got the adrenaline over and you just all you want to do is have some coffee and, and just you know watch the law and order reruns or whatever the hell you do on your on that Monday. Um, you still worry about the couple whose marriage is dissolving or the young woman who's cutting or the, the kid who is, uh, you know, uh, gay and hasn't been able to admit it to himself yet or, you know, your, your, your deacon who's upset with you or the, the are, are we going to have enough money for the, for the bills this month? And so your entire life becomes, and this is your family too, is my husband okay? Is my wife okay? Are my kids all right? Do I have I spent enough time with them? And so everything becomes triage. And there's never this sense where you just get up and you feel like, this is a good fucking day. This is fantastic. I have nothing to worry about today. No, because your job is to worry about shit. Yeah. And it, and it becomes very, very, it, 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 it's exhausting. And it becomes demoralizing. And you begin to look for small victories. And that's why I think a lot of pastors turn to the metrics. Because the metrics do provide some measure of victory. I mean, if we have more baptisms this year, or we had a high, you know, more attendance, or or whatever the hell the metric is, that at least provides some sense of satisfaction. Because when it comes down to just people and making sure they're okay, that door the door never stops revolving. Mm-hmm. So, and, and one one example is um, uh, there's a I, I'm part of a minister group. We get together every so often, kind of thing, uh, local ones, and we are all talking about our experiences of going on vacation common thread through all of them it took three days for your vacation to start exactly right and it's not because you're working it's because your body all of a sudden freaks out because you're not working in a triage clinic and you at least she even joked about it last week second or third day on vacation 
we literally did nothing. I'm totally good if we have plans. We are going to go see this, yeah. and then we're going to go do this, do this. And then we're like, oh, the second half of vacation, we're just going to sit at the pool. Well, yeah. first day we're sitting there, been there about an hour. I'm like, hey, what do you think about for lunch? You mean go get stuff for it? Uh, you know, I'd really like something to do. Uh, I'm just going to walk back to the room to go to the bathroom. And uh, while I'm there, maybe grab, uh, you know, I'll just listen to a lecture while I'm walking over there. And check the email real quick. Just make sure, you know, and, and we were all trying to talk about this. And, and everyone had these kind of experiences where it, it took days when you're on vacation to leave a triage modality. Yeah. It does. And, and the reality is you go back into it the day before you leave from your vacation because you begin to worry about what's on your desk when you get back. Yeah. And, and the thing is, and it's not that there aren't other careers that uh, you have this experience. It's just uh, there, m- most people know you have it, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> uh, this is sometimes, it's not like you go then and tell your church, like, yeah, they're like, hey, did you get that done? Actually, you know what? I didn't. Now, I actually didn't get a whole lot done, but I was completely stressed out over these other three things I'm not <laughs> at liberty to tell you about. But I'm dealing with them so you don't have to. And, you know, you're paying me to be loving to these people, and I'm trying to do that. It's just, you know, honestly, I didn't want to write the bulletin after I sat through those three conversations. I uh, looked at a Bible while I yeah. had a cup of coffee for an hour and a half. And, yeah. And so I, th- people do, I, don't, I don't think people know exactly what that what the existential reality is for a minister and how draining it can be and when especially when the congregations don't know it like unless you've had it you don't know what it's like to experience it yes and and that's right and they and and you can't talk about it because much of the talking about has to do with the perceived weakness that they will see in you and that's the other that's the other side of the triage you're constantly evaluating your own strengths and weaknesses to see how long you're going to be okay Am I depressed? Am I I'm okay? Are we having enough sex in my relationship? Am I drinking too much? Is what, what's going on? I mean, all of those factors that you look at to see if your mental health is okay. And if you've got any good sense at all, you probably sit down with a, a guy that, or, or a woman that's been a pastor at some point in his or her life as a counselor and say, okay, here's where I'm at. And you look for someone older and wiser to, to say, okay, here's what I see. Uh, because you're always doing triage and you can be really, really harsh on yourself at the same time that you can be really, really forgiving and gracious about somebody else. Uh-huh. Yeah, and, and the other thing is, and you mentioned a little bit, that if you're in a triage situation, it's hard to um, make decisions that are long-term ones. Yes. It's hard to go, actually, you know, my wife or my kid or my, you know, all that kind of stuff, or that's the most important thing right now, or, um, you know, I should probably actually be focusing on this for even the long-term benefit of the church or my career or whatever it is, um, uh, it, it's just, it, it's, it's hard to flip in and out. Yes, it is. And it, it's, an, I, it is not made better by standards. I, I saw that, uh, well, whatever, whatever, um, um, what's his name? Driscoll's little group is called out there. They have that little website. 29. No, no, that's the network, but they have the, like the website. It sounds very militant, whatever it is. I can't remember. And they had this eight signs that you're in a job and not a calling. And they were talking about how if your family doesn't like you doing your job and you're willing to listen to your family, then it's a, a job and not a calling. That your family needs to yield to God's call in your life. And it's like, if you don't understand that your family is the first and most important thing in your life, then you're deeply, deeply fucked. And if, and if any church is trying to tell you that that's not the issue, that you, you'll forever be doing triage with your family. Is my daughter angry with me? Is my son okay? Does my wife still love me? Is she having an affair? Am I going to have an affair? Uh, all of these things become a factor if the family's not put first. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, number one on the list <laughs> is you lose faith. Sometimes, and I don't mean that in a smaller sense. I mean, you can lose faith in the, in the building program or the, or the new Sunday school teacher, but sometimes you're just done and you leave the building. And there's not a whole lot you can do about it. I mean, I have friends that stayed, and I, and I know you saw the magazine article probably last year, I think it was Time or one of those, about how many pastors still in the pulpit are actually, uh, you know, at least pragmatically atheist. And I just, I'm not, I don't call myself an atheist. I don't like the definition of it. I don't like the options that Hitchens, no, it wasn't Hitchens. It was, uh, tell me, um, science guy. Dawkins. Dawkins. Dawkins, like six point sort of, you know, rubric. It's like, I don't like any of the options he gives me. 
but I'm not, I'm not a theist anymore for sure. And I'm not really a person who lives my life as if it matters. I'm fully, a, fully a skeptic. And it was, it was the most excruciating series of decisions I made in my life, uh, cutting up, cutting aside, you know, each piece of that sort of fabric that held me, uh, in, in terms of theism and church and ministry and faith. Um, but I, I, I watched it crumble. I could feel it falling apart. And you just, you don't, you don't get up in the morning and make a conscious decision that today I'm going to stop believing in another aspect of what I thought was eternally true. It's just that this shit happens. And then you try to parse it and you hopefully, like I have, find good friends who embrace you and allow you to be a skeptic. And Todd likes to say, you know, uh, Greg's a skeptic who's left the back door open. And that may be true. I'm not opposed to the idea of something. but Like what back you have, doors. Yeah. <laughs> what you have to know is that it's it's really it's okay. There there's another, there are options for you out there uh, that your life is not tied up in this sort of vocational thing. That if it really is a calling, if there really is a God, I suppose that God will call you back at some point. But you do at times lose the ability to believe, and that has to be okay. It can't be catastrophic. It has to be something that the church makes room for. I mean, the Catholics I think have done a far better job in terms of emphasizing, you know, the, the big deal is obedience. So it's easy to emphasize obedience over against belief. And they hope, I guess, by the, by the practice of the faith, that your actual faith comes back. I don't care. Uh, for me, uh, I think that I have a non-material perspective on, on faith these days, and that is as long as I'm pursuing justice and pursuing redemption and trying to help people live honestly and justly, uh, I don't know what else I need to do. I'm not sure what other things I have to add to my belief system, my, you know, Quine's little web. What other, what other nodes should I add uh, to make sure that I'm okay? Because I, I really feel like it's the doing that matters and not the not the believing. Mm-hmm. And so um, when, when you said that it could be not completely aware a question popping up in people's head like the beginning of that you're just like i just you know i got to the point where i didn't live as if life matters and then you're saying i realize that it's actually in the the, the living and 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 giving myself to these things of you know yeah. justice and stuff that that you know i decide to find fulfillment there so the when you were saying like i don't live as if life matters the next line that you didn't say is something like i don't live as if life matters to some transcendent other of some sort is that yeah no, I think that no, that's good. I, 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 I th- okay. Here's wow. All of my theology reduced to a couple of simple lines. Um, don't be an asshole, um, and as much as you can, try to heal the world. And I'm not sure how that's a bad idea or a bad way to live. Do I think God cares um, if I'm having sex with someone I'm not married to? No. Does God care if I love someone of the same sex and we actually have sex? No, I don't think... If there is a God, no. Why would, why would the God of the universe care about that kind of shit? Does God care that we live redemptively and creatively and in a way that heals the world? Well, yeah, if there is anything worth pursuing in this world, then it's redemption. And I don't mean redemption in the sense I get to go to heaven. I mean, it's helping someone be more okay with being that someone. It's it's fixing a kid who's broken or a marriage that's broken. And if, that, if that's not the kingdom of God, I don't know what the hell Jesus was talking about. Mm-hmm. So when you say things, because, uh, you know, like if you, the, the, even the examples you gave, like, oh, having sex with someone I'm not married to, is actually something most Christians have actually done, which is odd anyway. But... Um, but then in caring about redemption and stuff, how does that play out? Like, Because I know Christians that freak out the moment even boundary markers that they know most everyone broke um, uh, aren't there, right? Like, so, well, oh, Greg, if, you, if you're okay with, you know, having sex outside of marriage, then, um, you know, what, 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 you'll probably do almost anything, right? Yeah. So, so what what was it like to then think you're you know look I'm not becoming this crazy heathen who's just going to do whatever I want whenever I want to do it and get every, blah 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 blah. How do you explain that to people who would be really concerned about or about that kind of cavalier tone? Because I don't think you're you're saying you know, I just do whatever. I'm not. Yeah, that's, I don't. And I, I don't think anybody shouldn't just do whatever. I'm, I'm not a hedonist, and I'm clearly not a libertine. And there's a couple of things I'm not. And I'm also not a sociopath. Um, so I, I, I think that if the only thing that makes you kind and generous and giving and honest and sincere and faithful and redemptive is a, a set of metaphysical beliefs, then you're just a sad, sad example of a human being. I mean, I don't know how else I'll say that, Trip. It's like, I like, I love what I do. 
uh, and the, the teaching and the writing. I love what I do. And when I can, when I see kids who go from being a, 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 a certain way of looking at the world to another way of looking at the world, who actually learn and grow, I feel like I've contributed something to the well-being of the world. All right. And if you don't get some sort of satisfaction of helping someone, or or you know, holding someone, or taking care of a person, or or, or fixing, helping an animal, I don't give a shit. Um, then, then what the hell's wrong with you? Mm-hmm. I, I just so. I don't want to hurt people. I don't want to turn into this kind of, you know, hey, I'm single and not a Christian anymore. I can have, like, tons of sex, sex everywhere, sex, sex, sex. Uh, it's not, that's not the issue. The issue is how, how do I live in such a way that the relationships in my life are based on this reciprocal pursuit of redemption? So, in other words, I want my friends to help me in the ways that I help them. How is that a bad way to live your life, and why do I need God? What does God add to that equation? Mm-hmm. Well, the uh, one of the things that you you mentioned earlier, and I hope this is you know, helpful to people that are are in ministry, out of ministry, in the church, out of the church. Um, uh, but one of the things you said earlier is like you know when you were in church, you never had the experience of going, thinking yeah you know I'm who I'm supposed to be, right? And um and so I was trying to come up with a metaphor for Greg, and <laughs> so I've decided, and you can tell me if you like it or not, but. Um, it's at least attempting to be a compliment that, uh, you know, you quit being a used car salesman. Huh. You don't sell cars anymore, but you are the honest mechanic. And so oh, for those that. of us in the uh, uh, the car lot, um, there there's something very helpful for being able to send people to the honest mechanic for an assessment because you're like, you know, look, I'm selling these. I can't be honest with you right now. Like, because, uh, <laughs> well, it's commission and stuff, but... Yeah, I would go. I go see Greg real quick. You know, <laughs> if you're gonna take it to get it checked out before you sign that paper, you know, go over to Greg, because uh, he'll he'll he's he's looked under enough hoods. To, yeah. So, okay. so I, and in a sense, I actually think that in in that in that uh, capacity, you are doing something you're supposed to be doing, and it's beneficial to uh, plenty of people I know that are uh, still in the car lot trying to, uh, you know, help people get saved for Jesus. Because that's, uh-huh. that's that's the most important part of our job. You know, I, I, I had a student ask me one time why I still talk about Jesus in class. And here's the honest answer. That if anybody will apply the ethic, it has, it still has the power to transform a douchebag into a non-douchebag almost better than any other system I know. So by all means, follow Jesus. Please. And I mean literally, follow. <laughs> just do, <laughs> actually do it. Don't believe shit. Just do shit. Um, I, I mean, that's, that's, and that's why I still talk about it. I mean, I, I think it's a fantastic way of living in a very non-douchey way in a world that glorifies douchiness. Mm-hmm. Well, there you go. Uh, Homebrew Christianity listeners, <laughs> this is Greg Horton. Um with a top 10 list and we hope to uh, do it again and uh, let us know what you think um, n- next time I'm, I'm really hoping to get the top 10 of the uh, most offensive things you learned in your intro to religion class um, that your uh, Sunday school teacher didn't tell you yes mm. it'll be fantastic it'll be a lot more nerdy than this one but <laughs> but a little less a little less serious too yeah yeah well anyway uh, Greg, thanks thanks a lot for joining. And and w- real quick, you know, spout off website, Twitter, and such, so that yeah, if I'm they're real pa- lazy and don't go to the website to get the links, they can hear them. Sure, I'm on Facebook, and I'm also ex pastor on Twitter, and you can find me at theparish.tatpat.com. Booyah! And what's the, yep. what's the one where wine reviews? No, uh, that's Wine Rev. W i n e r e v Wine Rev on Twitter also. Yeah. See, you and See? Jesus. Me and Jesus, we love wine. And and Noah invented the first winery. And he was probably the first, uh, well, never mind. He was the first naked drunk that I know of in the Bible, but oh. it's possible there were others before him. I, I, I preached on that text a couple of weeks ago, and I've, I've gotten a, quite a number of uh, responses. I'm sure that's probably true. <laughs> Did you have a drama before? No, I, yeah. <laughs> if only Carmen had a song that acted out. <laughs> Uh, Ham assaulting his uh, father in his in his drunken stupor. Calling Todd tonight, telling us needs to be the next youth drama at the at the Baptist Church. It's uh, Shim Ham Japheth and Noah Nate had drunk and naked. That'd be fantastic. Oh, all right. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's fun. Indeed. Let's do it again soon. Cool. Sounds all good. Right.